Welcome and thank you for joining us for this Flinders University Brave Lecture titled For the Greater Good, Controlling COVID-19 Through Vaccination. I'm Karen Ashford and I'm delighted to be your MC tonight. Above all else, I'd like to acknowledge that this is taking place on the lands of the Ghana people and we acknowledge their elders, past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge the elders of all the lands upon which Flinders teaches and reaches. Today's event is delivered as part of the BRAVE lecture series, so called because through this series we showcase our researchers who challenge the status quo and bravely investigate with a view to resolve some of the big societal challenges of our time. This series is supported by Bank SA as our valued presenting partner. Please note if you can't stay for the duration of the event, you can watch the recording later on our website flinders.edu.au. As always, we're really keen to make this an interactive event with a live Q&A session. It's your chance to participate in the discussion and to pose questions to the speakers in real time. We do, however, ask that everybody treats this forum with respect, where engagement is respected and people are treated with dignity and differing views are tolerated. We're ready to start receiving your questions now via the message function on this platform, or you can join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Brave Research. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you today's speakers. Professor Jill Carr is a microbiologist specialising in infectious diseases and virus research with an interest in virus host interaction that can cause disease. Jill has a current NHMRC funded grant to investigate the interaction of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein in the lung to determine how best to manage adverse lung responses that contribute to COVID-19 disease. Professor Jonathan Craig is a clinical epidemiologist and vice president and executive dean of the College of Medicine, Health and Public Sci Medicine and Public Health. Sorry, Jonathan, I nearly messed up your college. Medicine and Public Health. He's a past member of the WHO Expert Review Panel on Global Public Health Strategy. Jonathan's many current advisory roles include member of the National Health and Medical Research Council's Health Translation Advisory Committee, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, Medical Services Advisory Committee, and Commonwealth Department of Health Life-Saving Drugs Program. Professor Paul Ward is a social scientist with a background in medical sociology, geography and health services to research, particularly around inequalities in health and medicine usage. Paul's research foci include lay and professional perceptions, knowledge and understanding of health, healthcare, medicines, risk and trust. So it's now my pleasure to start this evening's conversation by inviting Professor Carr to launch the discussion on controlling COVID-19 through vaccination. And she'll do this by explaining the virus and the development of vaccines to tackle it. Over to you, Jill. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. So uh, I'll start off, it's a pleasure to be here to try and uh, show you some things that we know about the virus and the vaccine platforms that have developed to, that really give us great confidence in the uh, vaccines that are going to be, uh, be delivered. But just to start off by reiterating about the, the disease, the numbers for COVID-19 are quite staggering. Uh, greater than 114 million global cases, 2.5 million uh, global deaths. And I've got a web link there that's to the John Hopkins uh, University website, which was one of the first ones that was up monitoring uh, case numbers, and you can get some really good information from uh, good university sites, uh, uh, public health uh, sites such as the WHO, Centre for Disease Control. But uh, we are really living in fairyland here in Adelaide, 618 cases, four deaths, and a case fatality rate of about 0.65%, which is pretty low when we compare that to some places such as Yemen, where it might be up around 27%, and that really reflects the social context of the, uh, the disease done a bit of the maths there for Adelaide. If we have a conservative 0.5% case fatality rate with 1.4 million people, that's about 700 deaths. And that sounds really quite small in uh, context of the, the global uh, scenario. But if we put that in context to a couple of years ago, a quote here from uh, the ABC News from Professor Paddy Phillips, the Chief Medical Officer from SA Health, where he referred to uh, 2017 as a horror year for influenza with 124 cases. So it's quite clear that COVID-19 is not just like the flu. 
And if we put that in the context of the, uh, the disease, uh, it is true that uh, most people don't suffer that bad from the respiratory illness, 80% roughly. These numbers are fairly, fairly rubbery. Asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic or outpatient ma managed disease, about 20% of people will go to hospital and about of those of, that go to hospital, about 20% of them will need some form of ventilation. But once you're on a ventilator, it's really quite a sad, uh, um, a poor outcome with about 50% of fatality of ventilated patients and those who do recover can still have some serious uh, morbidity. And that's talking about the respiratory and the lung pathology. Uh, on top of that, we have thrombotic effects. So that's uh, microvascular clots in the lung, clots around the, the body uh, that can be fatal. Uh, and there's uh, been a huge input of money just recently from the US into this uh, phenomenon called long COVID. So ongoing symptoms uh, after recovery from the acute respiratory illness. And these things can happen even in people who have asymptomatic or mild infections. And so it is absolutely true, COVID-19 is not just the flu and you, you certainly don't want to, to get it. So if we think about the virus, SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes COVID-19, the disease, and it is uh, nothing really surprising in terms of the virology. It is another zoonotic virus, and that means it comes from an animal uh, source. And so if we think of got some of the viruses up there that you might be familiar with, influenza A virus, we know that that comes from a, uh, um, a water bird and can mix in a, a pig and, so, and then get into the human population. HIV, which we're all familiar with, uh, probably had at least two incursions out of monkeys uh, or chimpanzees chimpanzees into, uh, into humans. And we know that SARS-CoV-2 came from a bat reservoir through some sort of uh, intermediate uh, host that we're unsure of. And what I'm going to focus on uh, uh, in the next few minutes is really the virology of SARS-CoV-2. I'm pointing with my finger because I didn't use the pointer. Uh, uh, the, those yellow spikes on the outside, uh, that's a protein of importance called the spike protein, which I'll refer to. And the green on the inside of that virion, which is where uh, the RNA, the, the genomic uh, information for the virus is. And so it is the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein or that S protein, the, the red thing on the outside of that image on, on the slide. And I'll just remind you that these are um, microscopic. You can't see them with the naked eye or a, um, a, a, a traditional microscope. You need a high powered electron microscope to see them. And that spike protein is the thing that's a good target for vaccination and has been all the vac vaccine candidates so far. And there's two real reasons for, for that. One of them is uh, up the top in that this is the thing that your immune system really sees, the things on the outside of the virion. And then the second thing down the bottom is that this spike interacting with the cells of your body is the thing that helps it to infect your respiratory tract. And I'll just point out that when your immune system sees this spike protein, the, the red thing on that, that image, it responds by generating uh, B cells, which are the things that go on to make antibody. And once you've made antibody, this is the protective thing that can go and interrupt that interaction of the spike protein with the cells of your respiratory tract. And this is here in this uh, image, which uh, thanks to uh, Tim, Brani and Andy for helping to get this image together of the spike protein in, in red up the top and the ACE2, the receptor that's on our cells in yellow down the bottom. And there's that nice interface that I've called the receptor binding interface, which is really this critical region that we want our antibodies to bind to. And it's this critical region for variants of concern. And that relates to the genome, which I'll talk about uh, uh, just now. And so the SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, and these are inherently uh, variable. Uh, we know that from uh, you know studying lots of different RNA viruses. And so compared, uh, and we're lucky that SARS-CoV-2 happens to be more stable than most RNA viruses. So for HIV, we know it's very variable, makes uh, lots of uh, changes in its genome, and we don't have a vaccine. And this is indeed one of the um, problems for generating a, a vaccine. We know that influenza A is variable as well, not as variable as HIV, uh, but we have a seasonal vaccine and that's again to account for this variability. And we're lucky that SARS-CoV-2 is similarly variable, but not as bad as HIV or influenza A, but it still can generate these VOCs, these variants of concern, and we think these may be a potential challenge for some of our, our vaccines. And how we know about these variants concerned, this is just from a NIH website, again, a very good resource, uh, and shows here, I've highlighted 80 odd thousand nucleotide records. And so we've sequenced lots and lots of viruses circulating in the population, not me personally, everybody. Uh, and uh, we've got a, a good handle on what kind of variants are, are out there. 
This is just highlighting some sequence data. So the colored peaks down the bottom are your AGCT, the things that go up and make your, your genome. And along the, the top there in numbers, we've got the amino acid sequence. And this is in that receptor binding domain, that interface that I showed you between the red and the yellow molecules. And these are where these variants of concern you might've heard of are, are arising and we know they're there. So these VOCs, and I won't refer to the country from they're from because that's not a good, uh, good thing to do. The B117 variant, so that has the N150501Y um, mutation in this receptor binding uh, interaction. The B1351 variant has both the N501 and the E484K. Uh, and then we also have these P1, P2 variants who have both those mutations and some mutations outside those domains. So we know these variants are out there. We know that some of these uh, variants will not bind as good to antibody from a natural infection and some monoclonals. But we know that that's not, not the end of the, the story. All the protection is not uh, likely to be lost because as I've put up there, your immune system just doesn't respond to those one uh, interactions. Your B cells will make lots of different kinds of antibody. Your immune system will also make T cells and other facets that are gonna give us some protection. So the variants of concern are concerning. We need to monitor them, but they're not the end of the world. So I'll just flip um, now to then talk about, that's the basic virology, and talk about some of the platforms that we can use to make um, a vaccine. And most of these platforms are fairly tried and true in the laboratory. We've got a lot of knowledge about them. And I'm gonna focus on the ones that Jonathan's gonna to refer to that are gonna be available uh, in Australia. So the first thing that we can do is make the spike protein, just that little red part of the, the virus in the laboratory. And this has been used very successfully for the hepatitis B vaccine, which is part of our vaccine schedule, the papilloma vaccine, which is part of, uh, again, our vaccine schedule and used in Australia. And this is the approach that is used by a company called Novavax for SARS-CoV-2, and that's uh, just been, a, um, been looked at by the, the TGA, which Jonathan will refer to. The second way that we can make a vaccine is these vectored vaccines. And so what that means is we're going to take a virus that we know a lot about called adenovirus. It's a common virus. Virtually everybody in the room's probably had it. And we make it replication defective so it won't spread throughout your body. And we make it express the spike protein, that, uh, uh, that immunogenic uh, red protein from the virus. And then we deliver it to people. And this is the approach that has been taken for what you would have heard on the Russian vaccine, the Sputnik V vaccine, the Janssen and uh, Silag vaccine, which again has been looked at by the uh, Therapeutic Goods Administration in the TGA in Australia. And then the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, the Chadox uh, vaccine. This is a chimpanzee derived adenovirus uh, vector, and that's the one that has been uh, the focus of a lot of media attention. The third way that's uh, drawn a lot of uh, interest as well as these new mRNA vaccines. And so similar to what I showed here in this previ oh, the previous one with the adenovirus delivering the S protein, in these mRNA vaccines, we have still have the RNA making that red, that spike protein, and we package it up in a nanoparticle made of, of lipid and then deliver that into the, the body. It gets taken up by the cells of your body. And I'll just reiterate that both the adenovirus strategy and this strategy are not permanent in your body. The body will clear them away. You're just gonna make the spike protein for a small amount of time for your immune system to uh, detect it and see it as foreign and then respond. And this is the approach by the Pfizer vaccine, which is the first one that's been rolled out in the phase, uh, phase one in Australia, and Moderna, which is a, an, another company. And these are new and exciting vaccine platforms that I really think are going to change the way that we look at, at vaccination going forward. So a bit of a silver lining out of the, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. So then to just summarize, I guess what I've told you and hopefully uh, showed you that uh, SARS-CoV-2, it's a new virus, but its properties haven't been too surprising or anything that has really um, uh, been outstandingly different from what we know in, uh, in terms of basic virology. The spike protein itself is an important target for the vaccine and it is used in all the candidates that we're looking at uh, so far. It doesn't mean that going forward will be the only thing, but it's uh, certainly uh, doing the job right now. There are viral variants of concern. It's not surprising that they've arisen. They will continue to arise undoubtedly, and we've got a number of platforms to make sure that we can uh, keep a good handle on them in the, in the community. The surveillance is really uh, the, the key there. There's successful and well-described vaccine platforms that have been adapted to, uh, to SARS-CoV-2. And these vaccines can similarly be adapted to then accommodate those variants of concern in a similar manner to what we do with the influenza vaccine and, and have seasonal seasonal changes in what we deliver. 
And so I'll just finish off then by saying that, uh, you know, people have discussed of how, how quickly we've moved on this. And I think it's a real testament to science of how quickly we've moved. And we've had the ability to move really quickly uh, to the reality of a COVID-19 vaccine because we've got such a, a foundational established knowledge in virology and uh, vaccine development. There have been a huge number of technical advances in the last couple of years that have allowed that to do that. And we've put in a huge amount of money that's really uncoupled that research and development phase with the, uh, the risk associated with the business of making vaccines and bringing them to the community. So I'll leave that there and then pass on to, uh, to Jonathan. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Jill. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jill, for providing, I think, a really um, fabulous summary of the underlying uh, immunology. I'm going to talk then about how that immunology, how our understanding of the virus has led us to uh, a lot of trials which can evaluate uh, how effective these vaccines actually are. I do need to put some caveats because, as we'll see, these data are rapidly evolving virtually day by day and certainly uh, week by week. Uh, and as always, I would encourage all who are watching to rely on government and state health department advice, which does change on a very regular basis. I also want to acknowledge that uh, Australia has had uh, a long experience with communicable diseases. If we go back to the impact of colonization on our First Nations people, with the introduction uh, of smallpox, uh, a great story in terms of eradication through the vaccine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the current landscape, a bit about the, our current uh, vaccination rollout strategy. Uh, Jill's already referred to the very rigorous program we have within Australia, the Therapeutics Goods Administration, some of the trial results, and then during our question and answer, we'll talk about commonly asked questions. What I do want to emphasize, uh, particularly now, is that, uh, that vaccination has to be a supplement and in no way is a replacement for public health measures in place. And I think we all need to be reminded of that. So what's the current landscape? So this is a screenshot from the WHO website and Jill has already given us a few examples of some fabulous evidence-informed data. And you won't be able to read the detail here, but I think it gives you a flavor of the scale of activity to do with the vaccines that are currently uh, being developed. So in summary, there are 447 clinical trials registered on clinicaltrials.gov from phase one to phase four. Phase one is very early uh, studies. Phase three, we're gonna focus on most today, which are the large scale clinical trials, which uh, enable us to work out whether these vaccines are safe and effective. And the phase four are, once they're rolled out into routine clinical practice, it allows us to look at long-term um, events that might be occurring. So 74 vaccines in clinical development, this scale of activity is virtually unheralded. 182 in preclinical development, 10 different types. Most uh, include two doses. There are a few coming through that only have one dose, uh, mostly, as you can see, in about 80% uh, intramuscular. So this is a, a figure, and I'll talk you through it, which, as you can see, was just published in the last couple of days. This color-coded indexes the, the broadly the five major types. Uh, you can see at the top is the BioNTech uh, Pfizer. Um, the, the, second, uh, the second group of data here is to do with the trials that have been published. So three published means these three vaccines, Biotech, Moderna, and Austra AstraZeneca, are the only three vaccines at present where we have the large-scale clinical trials of some 20 to 40,000 uh, that have been published and evaluated. This column refers to the number of doses available of those vaccines, and this line refers to a billion, okay? So at present in the world, the world has stocks right now of around a billion Pfizer doses, a billion Moderna, which is mostly rolled out in the US. And you can see a large number, at least 10 or 12 vaccines that right now there are 1 billion doses. The scale of this manufacturing activity is extraordinary. On the right-hand side, 
at the country's reporting use. And what I just want to refer you is that typically in a very controlled setting, we would only roll out vaccines for use if there are phase three trials, and that refers to those three vaccines. But what we can see is actually some countries are rolling out vaccines where we don't have those phase uh, three um, data. But the two vaccines in use in Australia, we have those two, uh, we have trial, the phase three, the big trials that we're going to explore in a little bit more detail. This, again, it's a very busy slide. It's not meant to uh, overwhelm you too much, but what it indicates, and again, this is the WHO, these, all of those blue lines refer to, take your web link for the details of the studies and the outcomes. This level of comprehensive and transparent reporting of design and data, again, is, an, is unheard of. The world is very well aware that everybody is looking at these data with great interest and this extraordinary uh, strong uh, uh, um, activities not only to generate as much data as possible, translate it into research and policy as rapidly as possible, but also to reassure people in the world, consumers of healthcare, that the data are transparent, nothing is being held back, you can go to it um, at your leisure. So what is the Australian vaccination rollout strategy? And I'm sure you'll be familiar with this approach, which is that it runs into three phases. The we're up to phase 1A at present, and the focus is primarily around quarantine of border workers and frontline healthcare workers. Uh, initially, it's with Pfizer. Uh, you will have seen media reports in the last week about the development or, or the shipping of, of that Oxford AstraZeneca. Where are we with respect to the regulation of these vaccines in Australia? So we have a very rigorous evidence-based process uh, called the Therapeutics Goods Administration in this country. Uh, and there are four particular, there are four particular, that's someone ringing. Uh, there are four particular vaccines that are being evaluated at present. Uh, the Novavax that we referred to before, the Janssen one, the Pfizer, and the AstraZeneca. So at present, there are two that have received provisional registration, the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca. And you can see uh, on this uh, table the active ingredient, the date at which it, it was entered into the so-called ARTG, which is effectively the register, the route of administration, intramuscular, the dosages for both of them, and we'll look at this in a bit more detail as two. Pregnancy B1 and B2 basically means that we have very preliminary data. Those large-scale clinical trials that are refer referred to just haven't included uh, pregnant women, so it's not as if it's not indicated. It's simply that we don't know as yet. Similarly, the age range is to do with the, the, the ages of those included in the clinical trials. The issue for the Pfizer vaccine, as people well know, we need a very an ultra-cold minus 80 degree freezer, so your home fridge is not going to work or your GP fridge is not going to work. You, um, a, a ref refrigerator at 2 to 8 degrees will work once it's reconstituted. In terms of manufacturing and dose, as you know, the AstraZeneca is available and is being manufactured in Australia at the Melbourne CSL site. Uh, but for Pfizer, we rely on, on overseas production. In terms of the doses, we don't know how much we're paying for these uh, vaccines in Australia. Data is uh, in the public domain in relation to the EU, UK, and US. And actually, given the scale of activity, uh, these prices are extraordinarily low. To put it in context, when the HPV vaccine came out, the price was around $400 per shot. Right? These are prices are, are, are very, very low. So what do we know about these? Let's first look at the Pfizer vaccine and then the AstraZeneca. So this is a typical, what we call a table one from a large scale randomized trial. In the first column, we see the characteristics of people who get the vaccine. In the second column, we see the characteristics of those who get placebo. Why do we need a placebo arm? Well, because we genuinely don't know 
whether the vaccine actually works. And the whole nature of randomization, effectively tossing a coin, means that at the beginning, the vaccine group and the placebo group are exactly the same uh, at the beginning, and therefore any difference in outcome can only be due to one thing, and that is that which is randomized, which in this case is the vaccine. In this study, nearly 38,000 participants across all the COVID vaccine trials, we're talking 600,000 so far. Again, you know, the, the, the information that we have in relation to the vaccine and their effectiveness is, is virtually mind boggling. Only adults aged 16 in stable medical conditions. What do we know about the safety? Well, as Jill demonstrated, what we actually want to do is, is, is encourage the body's own immune system to respond. And that's an evident locally because you get mild redness, pain, and swelling is very common. And that's a sign that the body is responding and generating antibodies and doing what is planned. In no case was there an admission for any adverse event. Uh, this is a two-dose regimen. Dose one and two are very similar, not worse than older people. Severe pain is rare, occurring at 1%, and overall in a similar in the placebo group. What about how well it makes you feel systemically? Well, again, uh, mild and moderate systemic events, things like fever, headache, chills are relatively common, uh, uh, prompting a use of something like paracetamol, much more common with the second uh, dose, but serious events are very rare. And again, these just go along with the fact that the vaccine is stimulating the immune system. What about the effectiveness? This is a very interesting graph. So this plots all of those little blobs are uh, COVID events. So someone getting sick with COVID on the blue line are those who get placebo and on the red line are those who get um, the, the um, vaccine. And you, the dark blobs are hospitalized. So you can see that the two curves separate very early at about day 10 with an overall vaccine efficacy of around 82%, that is about 82% of the COVID-19 uh, uh, illness is prevented. You get some benefit after the second dose, which is maximum around day seven. So overall, the efficacy is about 95%, the range. So in other words, if we did the study again, how confident are we that the true value lies between what range? It's about 90 to 98%. What's very important is the benefit is consistent irrespective of how old you are, which country the study was done in, gender, and after two doses and three weeks. The Oxford AstraZeneca story is a little bit more complex, so I'm going to talk you through that. This is a similar graph. It's a different journal, so it looks a little different. But again, you can see the separation in terms of the number of people who get uh, infections. This first study, the first publication, four trials, three different countries. The UK, there was a low dose and a standard dose. And this first publication, I re only reported about the half of those who had participated to date. Overall, about 70% effectiveness seemed to be greater in those who had two doses with a low dose first and then a high dose. 10 were hospitalized, all in the control group, and very similar adverse events to what I've seen before. Now, the analysis that has just come out in the last one to two weeks is looked at, well, what happens if you change the interval from three weeks for that booster dose to 12 or more weeks. And what we can see here is that the efficacy of the vaccine increases substantially uh, up to about 80%. And it works irrespective of whether you got the first dose, low or, or standard dose. And importantly, this study also looked at the impact on asymptomatic infection. So in the UK study, Everybody had a real-time test for COVID, irrespective of they had symptoms every week. And in fact, it looked like it not only prevented the serious infections, any infection, but also the asymptomatic infection. So where, what's, where are we up to? Well, as I've, I think I've shown you, the amount of activity has been extraordinarily 
large and is rapidly moving, we have a huge number of candidate vaccines. We have two provisionally registered for use in Australia and being rolled out, Pfizer uh, and AstraZeneca with, with at least two more on the way. TGA, very detailed evaluation determination, they're safe and effective. Yes, there are minor local and systemic reactions. These are common uh, and again, a sign that actually the vaccine is doing its job. It's, it's stimulating the immune system. Serious side effects are rare. Both are effective for symptomatic COVID, um, between 80 and 95%, and almost completely prevent the serious, the hospitalized infection. Impact upon transmission, which is that if I pass it on to, to someone else, I know if I'm vaccinated, the likelihood of me getting sick is reduced by 80 to 95%, but could I still pass it on to someone else in a very asymptomatic way? We don't, we're not 100% sure yet. Uh, those data are still emerging, but it does look positive. But the other, th my last point before I hand on to Paul is that there's a lot of quoting about Pfizer's better than AstraZeneca. The problem with that is that actually we don't really know the relative effectiveness. The only way to compare one against the other, which is unlikely to happen, is a head-to-head -head trial. If we want to work out which sporting team is better, right, we do, we compare them head-to-head. -head. We don't compare them by another team. So at the moment, we don't know which is better. What we do know is that both of them are well exceeded beyond the level that we would regard as effective. Paul. Thank you. Is it that one? No. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. So, so so far we've heard from a virologist around the the, the virus and the de and the developmental process of um, the vaccine. We've heard from a clinical epidemiologist around how the vaccine trials have worked and all, all and the effectiveness and safety of vaccines. And now you're going to hear from me around what might happen when this gets put into big human populations, and particularly around uh, the notion of vaccine hesitancy, around um, people who may question the, whether or not to have the vaccine. And I want to quickly run through a couple, of, a couple of bits. So I want to give you some data from some studies that were undertaken, funded by National Health Medical Research Council and Australian Research Council around trust in vaccines generally and particularly around COVID-19 vaccines. Then some evidence from some recent studies around the intention to um, vaccinate. What, you know, what are people talking about in terms of whether they intend to vaccinate or not? Some evidence around why people say that they might not vaccinate around COVID-19 and some ideas around what can we do? How can we, as, as the rollout in Australia happens, how can we try to counter misinformation or fake news and hopefully increase um, vaccination uptake in Australia? Just a, a couple of little uh, caveats. When I'm talking vaccine hesitancy here, I'm talking about people who are uncertain, they're still deciding. So the so-called fence sitters. So people who haven't quite made a decision yet. And that's quite different to the, the, the term, the, the term anti-vaxxer that's used a lot in the, in the press, which most of us in, in the field of research don't particularly like that term, but nevertheless it's used. And that's the people who've got little or no, no room for deliberation. They made their mind up, they're not gonna vaccinate, that's the deal. And in public health, the groups that we work the most with try to understand and try to, um, uh, yeah, try to understand are vaccine hesitant people. So I'm gonna just show you a bit of data on um, some, uh, so, some um, interviews that we've been doing with people in lockdowns last year in, um, in South Australia. In general, there was a real kind of level of trust in the government and in public health and medical experts. Um, quotes around governments are doing as much as they can. Everybody's doing what they can. I'm happy with the government. Another one, put, they're the experts, as in, public health people, I'm not the expert, you get these idiots, sorry, I shouldn't call them idiots, but seriously, on social media, they're protesting, 50,000 of them, you know, we need to do as we're told. So there's an overriding sense of, we're, we're in this together, we're trusting government, we're trusting public health and medical experts. 
in our research, there's also a, a smaller but nevertheless vocal um, minority of, of people who are, you know, have got clear distrust in government, clear distrust in public health and medical experts and, and, and sociologists, I suppose. You know, a, one person said, I'm not getting the vaccine. If they bring it out, I'm not doing it. I just don't trust big pharmaceuticals. And I'm going to get onto that a little bit because I think it's something we need to hit head on and deal with. One of the issues around COVID-19 era, the pandemic era in particular, has been this massive amount of information that, you know, the volume of information, the speed of information. You know, Jonathan was talking about trials that were out a couple of days ago. You know, the, just the volume and speed of information makes it really difficult for people out there in the big wide world to, to kind of figure out who do I trust and why do I trust and how do I trust and, you know, things are changing. What do I do? And, and these couple of quotes really kind of show the, the anxiety that's brought around that. You know, one person said, either they're trying to do a new world order and they're trying to inject us with microchips. But then I thought that was a bit far-fetched. So I thought, mm, maybe I'm overthinking it. I had a bit of anxiety, but just the emotional kind of walking in circles. And another person said in, in one of the interviews, every day we get something different. We get another bulletin from the government. There's something new you've got to keep up with. It just drives me mad. All these emails. I read them later, but actually, I've just stopped reading. And I think that's a really important thing that we need to think about as scientists, as researchers, as the media, around how, how are we getting our information across to people in the way in which people just don't stop reading. And the WHO have, have, have termed this an infodemic, an epidemic of information. Um, and, and linked with this... Um, infodemic, there's kind of two responses that researchers are finding. One of them is this heightened negative emotional response. So this overload of information for some people leads to fear and anxiety and anger and, and lots of uncertainty. But there's another mob of people for whom this leads to, like, like the people there that, that, that I talked about, detachment, a dampening, kind of I'm, I'm going to turn off, I'm going to underestimate the risk, the severity and risk of COVID are not that big, and I'm turning off. So two quite different responses to this overriding infodemic. And both of those have been shown to interfere with, interfere with both the motivation and the willingness to vaccinate. So we need to think that through a bit. Another piece of research that, that we're doing, and there's some um, and references there to, to some papers that, that I just want to quickly highlight is the way in which, and th this is from a study with parents who don't who make decisions not to vaccinate their children, who are likely to be part of the, the vaccine hesitant people with COVID-19, whereby this idea of big pharma, so big pharmaceutical companies, and when we're thinking of COVID-19, we're talking about Pfizer and AstraZeneca, we're talking pharmaceutical company names, needs to be taken into account. So there's this idea that Big pharma is tainting research, the motives of health professionals, and government. So the, the, the quote at the bottom, the pharmaceutical thing to me is just money-making. They're a business. They make money from people that get getting sick. I, they don't want to find a cure for this or that because it means people won't rely on their drugs. They want people to stay sick. And this is not me saying that. This is some, some published evidence that we, we've um, published from interviews. And as a researcher, I'm implicated in this. So there's a perception that big pharmaceutical companies influence the research that happens in universities. There's a suspicion that university research on, on vaccination is funded all by big pharma. And that big pharmaceutical companies then determine what we can and can't disseminate based on their profit motives. There's also a perception that big pharmaceutical companies have an influence over doctors. So the puppet master starts to, to play. The, the big pharmaceutical companies holding are the puppet master, and sitting under that are doctors, researchers, and government. Concerns that um, big pharma can influence doctors through presentations or what's called kickbacks or junkets, and also back to doctors' training, even when they were medical students at universities. This was a quote, the pharmaceutical companies supply the universities with funding. So it comes down to the doctors. Their kind of operation comes from their training, which is funded by big pharma. That's not necessarily, that's not the case, but that's not the point. The point is that there's a real feeling of this and we need to be kind of trying to counteract this when we're thinking about the rollout of COVID-19 vaccinations. 
and it go and it rolls onto government. So questioning the link between government and pharmaceutical companies. I think they, the pharmaceutical companies, own the government. The leads of the government have got shares in pharmaceutical companies that these vaccines represent, so there's a conflict of interest. So all the way through, this, this puppet master is a really important thing to keep in mind as we counter some of this potential misinformation. And what's really critical in all of this is trust. How do we build trust with people so that, so that people um, are free and informed consent, but, but trust the kind of information that, that, that's been put out there. The, the, the picture on the left is an actual poster that's actually out there in the big wide world. Trust the lies, not the truth. The one on the right is an actual tattoo of a person that's had a tattoo that says trust no one, trust nobody. And in the middle, this is the old idea of trust me, I'm a doctor. And, and that's no longer the case. Trust is no longer a given, it has to be worked on and it has to be won. We can't just assume that because a doctor says something that people will all of a sudden trust them. And the, and the quote there, I, I always think about, trust comes in on foot and it goes out on horseback. So it comes in meekly, it's hard to get it, but as soon as you lose it, you lose it quick. And you know, we've all seen lots of, of protests and the link between the COVID vaccination and um, 5G the pro-choice, the fake news. Th this is the reality. This is the reality within which the COVID-19 vaccination has been rolled out. And what th this is what we, we need to be working with and to understand. But one thing that's really, really important not to do, in, in our view, is the negative stereotyping around vaccine refusing parents is really, um, and I'm going to show a quote, re leads to people um, stop using health, stopping using health services. So this was a, a, um, a, a cartoon in the New Yorker quite some time ago. And, and you know, they were trying to be, um, I don't know what they were trying to do, but it was a really, really derogatory. If you connect the measles, it spells out my parents are idiots. You know, there's a kid with, with measles and, it, and it's just this kind of them and us, which creates the anti-vax, pro-vax groups, which does nothing. It does nothing apart from, you know, I wrote something in The Guardian not that long ago, show, talking about how all this does is create even more distrust in science. You know, we're not doing a service, we're doing a disservice by the judgment and, and stereotypes. And that quote was of a person who doesn't take their kid to the doctor anymore because of the judgment that, that, that they get. So what do we know about vaccine hesitancy globally in Australia? Globe, you know, vaccine hesitancy, we, we have to be aware that this is around intention to vaccinate. It's not about whether people have or haven't, it's about intention. USA and France, 20 to 25% of people are saying they're not going to have the vaccine. In Australia, there, there's slight differences between the proportion of, of people who say they're definitely not going to have the jab, the, the so-called anti-vax and the proportion of people who say they're hesitant, they're not kind of sure yet. But what we need to be aware of is, is what's, what's called the intention behavior gap. There's a difference between the intention and the actual behavior. And we've got time in Australia. The big rollout to the mass population isn't happening quite yet. We have time to try to, to, to reduce the intention, um, the, the proportion of people who are hesitant. And, we, and, and from that literature, we know that women are more likely to be hesitant, and that might be fears or risks around pregnancy and breastfeeding. Younger people are, are more hesitant to uh, vaccinate. It might be about lower perceived risks, and culturally linguistically diverse groups are more likely to be hesitant, which might be around lack of appropriate awareness strategies. A really recent um, study in Australia looking at changes in um, hesitancy from August last year to January this year, and unfortunately showing that more people are becoming more hesitant. So as time moves on, a larger proportion of the people are questioning whether they're gonna get the vaccine or not. And the things that, 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 that the researchers have come up with is um, Australians who think too much has been made about the COVID-19 vaccination are less likely to want to vaccinate. The people who've got lower trust in hospitals and people who are not optimistic about the next 12 months. And that's a key thing that I'm gonna come on to. This shows the difference between August 2020 and January 2021. So in August 2020, 
you can see on the left hand, they're all smaller. Well, the red and the, the um, orange are, are smaller in August than they were in January, meaning more people are becoming more hesitant. More people are becoming more likely to refuse. And the blue bar definitely will. 59% in August were definitely going to vaccinate a much lower proportion in January this year saying they're definitely going to vaccinate. The, you know, a, an issue that we need to deal with. What might we do? There's a, a co couple of things. W you know, the obvious things are programs and strategies and, 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 and information um, campaigns which improve the trust in the safety of vaccine. Evidence-based, understandable to the public information. Inform information that, that reminds people about the dangers of COVID-19. And the problem with that is it might elicit two different kinds of responses. Fear in some people. And but so, so, so you know, it, there might be a bunch of people that become fearful and then react in a, in a particular way. But it might counteract those disengaged people, the people who've turned off. And also highlighting the potential for a better 2022, you know, sh showing that the future can be a, 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 much, a much greater thing. Also drawing on what's called anticipated regret. So by saying things like by not getting the COVID-19 vaccine, a family member might get infected or you might not be able to go overseas. Also on pro-social motivation, protecting, it's about protecting your family, protecting the community, which has been shown to be more important than saying this will protect you. So pro-social motivation is, is, is a thing. And this idea of inoculation messaging. So as we're getting more of this misinformation, um, conspiracy theory, fake news, trying to protect the public from buying into this. So it's what, what, what's called misinformation literacy. How do we support members of the public to know when stuff is just misinformation and fake news? But ultimately, it's about one size is really unlikely to, to fit all. We've got different responses. We've got different kinds of people in different kinds of contexts. So avoid generic messages, but target particular groups with particular messages and particularly from trusted sources. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul. That was uh, fascinating. And thank you, Jonathan and, and Jill. This is a really complex area. It does raise lots of questions and it's clear that research and evidence is absolutely crucial. So if you have a question about any of this, please don't hesitate, whether it's here in the room or online, uh, get it through now and we'll do our best to get to all of them tonight. We've already had quite a few questions coming through and I'm going to start by actually drawing two together which are in a similar theme. Um, and we have a, an initial question uh, from an anonymous writer asking, I'm in a vulnerable group. Am I allowed to select which vaccine I would prefer? And uh, we also have somebody else who asks, what are the possible consequences if you have a seriously compromised immune system? So concerns about the safety and efficacy, for, particularly for people who may have a pre-existing con pre condition. Um, are you able to perhaps take us through that? Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, so in terms of the first uh, question, uh, thank you, Anonymous. Um, you cannot uh, really select which, which vaccine you get. This issue has come up, up in the States where there are a number already um, in uh, distribution uh, and it's a, a matter of what is being rolled out and what is uh, available. I know Jonathan showed the numbers and, and billions of doses that we have, but in the global scheme, it's, uh, you know, it's, you're going to be lucky to have one. Uh, on offer, so it won't won't be an issue of being able to select. The second issue of people with uh, pre-existing uh, conditions. So in general, if you have a vaccine that has some sort of live organism and you've got uh, in some form of immunocompromise, uh, you would not be recommended that uh, that vaccine. And I'm not exactly sure on the data on the adeno, uh, Jonathan, whether in any of those I'm pretty sure immunocompromised were uh, were excluded. And I'm pretty certain that in the phase one rollout, people with pre-existing conditions would be given the Pfizer vaccine in, in preference to the AstraZeneca, but I'm not exactly sure on the data on that. So good advice. So I, I would just add mm. that they are safe. Uh, there isn't an issue with respect to the virus replicating in people who are immunosuppressed. Uh, there are all different types of immunosuppression. So it's difficult to provide a one-size-fits-all response and it would be critical to have for individuals to have advice from their own treating physician. The one thing I would add is that um, the, the, vax, the, the group who are most at risk from SARS-CoV-2 
is exactly the immunocompromised group. So actually that's the group to whom uh, we need, they're the prioritized group. Uh, some type of immunocompromise means that they cannot get a good antibody response to the particular vaccine. So that's why the individual cons consultation with treating physicians is so critical. Mm, so seek that professional medical advice. We, we have a question from Grant. Does the panel believe it's appropriate to increase Australia's capabilities in the area of mRNA vaccine production, or are there other areas of vaccine production which are of a higher priority? Uh, I guess I can speak to, to that one. Uh, as I said, I, I personally feel that the mRNA vaccines are are a really wonderful new platform that has come to the fore and, you know, really been uh, uh, risen up in this uh, pandemic as being uh, just far more efficacy than we could have really um, predicted. Um, and I can see that they are certainly being looked at being applied, for instance, for, for flu vaccines. Um, so I guess it is uh, remains a company decision to invest in that. We have a whole lot of infrastructure, for instance, at CSL for producing these other vaccines, which are still efficacy. And so it then, I guess, becomes a company decision about whether or not they can invest in the technology for making those mRNA vaccines uh, and a long-term uh, strategy. So I think we're sort of at that phase, and, and I don't know if you sort of agree, uh, Jonathan, where... Uh, you know, a, a short-term strategy to get as many doses out to as, as many people as possible. And then I think there'll be some sort of a, a reconciling about what is going to be the most cost-effective uh, and efficient way to um, deliver those vaccines down the track once we've all got, you know, at least the first round of protection. Yeah, so, so I would absolutely agree. Uh, I think as Australians, we would, we're in a very privileged position uh, we may get to discussion a bit, bit later about what our response might be as good global citizens, but within Australia, we're in a very good position. We have two uh, very effective vaccines available. It's highly likely there'll be another two uh, uh, available shortly, should the phase three trials demonstrate the same effectiveness. Uh, I did hear an interview with the CSL chief executive who said that they could uh, make a transition to mRNA-based vaccines. Inevitably, that would take a number of months at least uh, to, to, to roll out, but I, I'm sure that that's been considered. Great. We have uh, just over five minutes left, so we'll get to a few more questions. Uh, we have another question from an anonymous writer asking, are there adjuvants such as aluminium in any of the vaccines? So adjuvants, uh, which are um, a, a mechanism by which we see vaccines essentially assisted delivery. So uh, do we have adjuvants like aluminium in any of these vaccines? So alum is a common uh, adjuvant that's used in uh, vaccines. The subunit vaccines, such as the Novavax uh, vaccines, tend to require an, an adjuvant to stimulate. That gives a non-specific stimulus to the immune system and kicks into more than just the B cell responses, so it gives you a broader uh, response. Um, the mRNA vaccines are sort of naturally adjuvanted with the components that uh, package up the, the mRNA. Uh, the adenovirus-based vaccines don't have uh, an adjuvant, and I'm not exactly sure if alum is in any of the uh, the other ones. Do you know, Jonathan? Or not often. Mm. Yeah. Well, we have another one which is a little bit trickier, I think, um, and this is from an anonymous writer. If vaccines are 95% effective and you don't know if they stop transmission, why the push to get everyone vaccinated? So let's think about the rationale behind vaccination if there is... Um, you know, such an effectiveness, do we all need to have it? Um, you know, if it's effective in some, is that on, not enough? So, uh, do you, uh, well, maybe Jonathan's got a slide, but my, well, my fundamental response yeah. to that would be is it's seen to be uh, almost 100% effective at stopping severe disease. And that's the bottom line of what we want to stop is people going to hospital, people dying. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's absolutely essential to vaccinate everyone. Did you? Sure. Yeah. I just need to preface the notion about transmission. So it's not that the vaccine does not stop transmission. It's just that where we are in the development of, of information, we're not as confident about the transmission effects as we are 
in relation to its impact upon severe disease. Do I think that it's very likely it will stop transmission? Absolutely, the data seems to be increasingly more consistent in that regard. Leanne asks, what might booster vaccines look like down the track? I'm not quite sure what Leanne means by that, whether she means what they're physically going to look like or will there be variants on the types of vaccines that we use as boosters instead of repeat doses of the original, perhaps? Well, I'll kick off with that one. So, I mean, you know, we're relatively early on in the journey. Uh, as I said, we're, we're extraordinarily fortunate to have literally dozens of potential vaccines um, available at present. We don't know what the long-term immunity that will occur with these vaccinations, those studies are being developed. So is it likely, let's say in a year or two, that additional doses might be required? Uh, I think the answer is almost certainly yes. Uh, will it be the same vaccines that we're giving at present? Um, uh, at, at, we have most data where the same vaccine is given at least twice but increasingly we're going to get more data about a kind of mix and match approach. So it's a great question. I'm not sure that we know as yet, Jill. Yeah, I think I sort of indicated in my the talk that I can see a scenario where it's a bit like the seasonal influenza, probably not an annual update. There's some data for other seasonal coronaviruses that you probably get immunity out for, for seven years. And so whether or not we have some sort of booster, have some sort of back for a second vaccination, particularly if we're seeing some of these variants of concern, maybe not as frequently as we do for the influenza uh, vaccine. And we'll have, again, surveillance mechanisms to support that and indicate what's what's an appropriate response. Mm. We have a, a follow-up question which more or less flows on, and that is what percentage of the population could make herd immunity effective? So how many people really need to be vaccinated for us to have confidence that... Uh... So that's a great question. So uh, here's a <laughs> answer I pre prepared earlier. So that we're all on the same page. So herd immunity is the indirect protection at a population level. So what we've talked about so far is the direct. If I get vaccinated, what's going to be my reduction in COVID-19? That herd immunity is not just the benefit for me, but actually the benefit for the population level. We don't, we don't really know. Um, herd immunity is based on a whole bunch of factors, one of which is the infectivity of the virus itself. As Jill has shown, that doesn't seem to be absolutely stable right now, how effective the vaccine is the dura and the duration of immunity. Just to give you a kind of flavor, here is a graph, uh, which was published relatively recently. Uh, of not only SARS-CoV-2, but a whole range of viruses and sort of indicative herd immunity. So modeling data suggests that sort of 60, 60 to 80 percent of the population, but that will become more apparent once whole populations are being immunized, where we will see that, um, where we'll see empiric data for that. Now, I've got a question for Paul. I've also got another one, which I think is probably going to land in Jonathan's lap. So I might ask Paul's question first, knowing I've only got a few minutes left. Um, but Paul, we have a question here. What should I say to someone who I think may be vaccination hesitant? So what is the best way of approaching that communication? And there is a follow-up message asking about your thoughts on a vaccine passport for future access yeah. to services. So can I perhaps throw those two yeah. your way? I mean, I, mean, I guess... First, it, it's important not to be a kind of um, pop epidemiologist or a pop scientist. So it's important to kind of provide the evidence, the, the actual evidence for safety and effectiveness for, to start off. You know, I'm a, I mean, it's interesting. You get a, a virologist, a clinical epidemiologist and a sociologist, and we can all talk about different things um, and we can all have expertise. But as a, you know, as a lay member in terms of not a virologist and not a clinical epidemiologist, my, my first port of call is, well, what does the evidence actually tell us? So, so or, you know, government websites, all those things. I guess then to be clear that my personal view, if this is what I were doing with a, with a friend, my personal view is that the evidence is clear on safety. The evidence is clear on effectiveness. And then, and then it's about some of the ideas around, so, you know, if, if, you, if you weren't to vaccinate, what about what that might do for 
your friends or your family. If you weren't to vaccinate, what might that do for your chances of going overseas to visit your friends and you know to, to go and visit? So there are a whole range of both evidence-based, this is the evidence on safety and effectiveness, and then a whole range of kind of emotional responses, which I, which I think can be used in, in, in different ways. Lovely. Thank you, Paul. Any uh, views on the passport question? A vaccine passport? Do you have a position on that? I mean, my, my, I don't know if I've got a position. I think it's relative, it seems uh, relatively clear that there will probably be one. It seems relatively clear that lots of international airlines are saying at least that they're going to require some kind of evidence. I mean, that's not a vaccine passport per se, but but when people have the COVID-19 vaccine, they'll be put on the Australian uh, um, Immunisation Register. So there will be evidence of having the vaccine. Um, so it's there. I think it's... The, the Commonwealth government have been clear that they will not mandate the vaccine. So they've been clear it's not mandatory to have it. If people then choose to want to go overseas and the, and the carrier has a, you have to be vaccinated to come on this aeroplane or you, or you have to be vaccinated to come into this country, then I think that's kind of outside my personal mm -hmm. views. Yeah, thank you, Paul. We have a question from the audience. I know the clock is ticking, but Professor Claire Roberts, Oops. I believe you've got, uh, got a question. Thank you. As a pregnancy researcher, I have to ask a question on behalf of the 300,000 women in Australia who will be pregnant this year. What advice can we give them, given that the trials excluded pregnant women? So uh, I might have a go at that. So... Uh, uh, thank you, Claire, and it's a, it's a good question and it's clear that the Commonwealth Department, the College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology have spent a great deal of time on this. And so in blue highlighted, there is a decision aid for women uh, with preg who are pregnant. And the bottom line is that no, no vaccination as of yet routinely because the trials haven't included women though pregnant women, those trials are happening right now. And so an individual discussion needs to be had with the treating physician and the, the woman concerned. Uh, but if you read the decision aids, it's clear that there is emphasis placed mostly on women who are at high risk of exposure or, or at high risk of severe disease. That is women who've got other comorbidities, in which case more vaccination is more likely than less likely. But if there's no other comorbidities, then sit tight. Uh, we're in a really great place in Australia right now, uh, unless you're in a high risk situation for those trials and more evidence to come through. And there should be some data coming, surely, from the millions of people who've already been vaccinated in other countries. Some of them would have to have been pregnant, particularly frontline workers. Yeah. So uh, you probably know the data better than me. Yeah, even in some of the initial trials, there were people who uh, fell pregnant during the trial and uh, had no adverse outcomes. So that's encouraging data, but not the uh, actual trials that we do need. The, the numbers actually are in the tens, um, like 60 odd, for example, in a lot of those trials. So the numbers are relatively small, but as uh, Jill said, the, there was no issue around the safety. In terms of if impact on breastfeeding, the short answer is that vaccination is safe and for breastfeeding women. Thank you for those Thank questions, Claire. Um, this is our final question for this evening because we have come to time and we're now a few minutes over, but I do want to allow uh, this early correspondent uh, a chance for a response. The question is, can you explain pathogenic priming and explain, even though it's been a problem in the past, we're now told it's no problem, but we don't have long-term studies or animal trials. So pathogenic priming, do we have confidence? So I might um, take a guess at what they mean by pathogenic uh, priming. So there was a, a lot of early on worry about this phenomenon of uh, an antibody dependent enhancement where you've had a, a, um, an infection before and you get a secondary infection and then the disease is worth, worse because of the antibody response. And that certainly happens with, with dengue a virus that I, I work on. And that was said to potentially be a problem with some coronavirus. So there hasn't been any evidence that that 
that really exist except for some coronavirus in, in cats. Um, and there is has been some issues previously with SARS-CoV-1 where a prior vaccination that induced a particular kind of immune response could have had some lung pathology associated uh, with it. And we've learnt from those, uh, um, those kinds of studies and tried to have our vaccines skew the immune response in a, in, a, in a different way. So I think that's probably what the question is getting at, unless you know the term pathogenic priming. <laughs> yep. I'd say we're probably landed fairly close to the mark. So thank you for thank that. Thank you. Um, look, we have run to time um, and uh, we uh, really do need to conclude uh, the conversation as interesting as it is. Um, but I would like to thank Jill, Jonathan and Paul uh, for sharing your time, your knowledge and your expertise with us this evening. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank our audience who have joined us live tonight and also online for uh, their input and interest in this event. Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge once again Bank SA for supporting this series. Remember you can watch this series again on Flinders YouTube channel or our Brave webpage where you can also register to receive notifications about future events. So thank you once again and good night.